and welcome. I'm Adele Gautier from Breast Cancer Foundation NZ, and tonight we're talking about mammograms. Before we get started, some housekeeping. If you have any technical issues, you can type details of your problem in the chat box at the bottom left of your screen, and our support team will get in touch. Or you can call the number you'll see there and enter the passcode to get some help. If you have sound problems, you might want to listen on your phone while watching on your computer. You'll see some instructions for how to do that at the bottom of your screen. You can use the chat box during the webinar to ask questions, which we'll get to later. And you can also chat to other people who are participating. Don't worry about missing out on valuable information while you're chatting. The webinar is being recorded and we'll be sending you a link to it in the next few days. So tonight we're talking about mammograms and breast screening. How do they work? What happens? We have three panelists who are going to share with you. Lorna Sabritsky, Dr. Monica Sani from Hutt Hospital, and Dr. Sally Yuri from County of Manukau Breast Screen. First, we're going to hear from Lorna. Many of you will know her by her voice, if not by sight, from her weekday show on Coast FM. Lorna, thank you so much for being here tonight. Tell us about your experience of mammograms. Sure, okay. So um, I've had breast cancer and I consider myself very lucky because mine was caught early and it was caught early because of mammograms. Now breast cancer is something that in our family we've always talked about because my father's mother died when he was just 12 and um, she was a solo mum so as you can imagine that um, deeply affected his, his childhood. So what that impressed upon me is that not only does breast cancer affect the patient, but it affects everybody around them. So it has always been something we talked about. At the age of 22, I found a lump in my breast and I was convinced that was it. I've got breast cancer. I'm going to die very young, just like my grandmother. Um, but I wanted to be around to see my grandkids, so off I went to get it all checked out. And I had a needle biopsy, and it turned out to be uh, just a benign cyst. So great news. Fast forward to about... 42, I think I was, 43 perhaps, and I uh, discovered another lump in my other breast. This one seemed a bit more sinister. Again, I wasn't quite so melodramatic, but again, I was pretty convinced that it was uh, going to be bad news. So I went along, and this time, as well as a mammogram and ultrasound, I also had a core biopsy, and um, I'll never forget the relief uh, when it came back negative. So again, it was a benign cyst. And then, and I'm really ashamed to admit this, then I kind of got a bit complacent. Um, checked at 43, I'll register at 45 for the screening program, but I didn't, uh, which is pretty bad. And then uh, when I was maybe 47, a very dear friend of mine, Helena McAlpine, who many people may know of uh, because she did a lot of tireless work for the Breast Cancer Foundation, even while she was dying of breast cancer, she passed away far too young, and I sat in her funeral and I promised her that I would go and make my appointment the very next day, which I did. Um, so it was about this time three years ago, because it's just past three years, mm -hmm. isn't it, since Alina died. Mm -hmm. um, so I went along and this was the first mammogram I'd ever had out, out of the three times where I didn't feel that there was anything wrong. There were no lumps, I felt great, I felt fine, I was just honouring my commitment to my friend. Um, so off I trotted. Unfortunately, uh, after a series <laughs> of tests and things, um, I was recalled and it turned out that I had DCIS, which is very early breast cancer, but it was high grade, so that you know, it was multiplying quite quickly, and so um, this was in November I was diagnosed. Three days before Christmas I had an operation. Um, I got a phone call from my surgeon on New Year's Eve saying, it hasn't spread, woo -hoo. Um I cried in the mall and bought some champagne, <laughs> and, um, and then by April I had finished a course of radiotherapy, and now, touch wood, um, I am cancer-free. But what I have impressed to all my friends is that we have a fantastic program here in New Zealand, free screening for every woman between 45 and 69 every two years. But I am further impressed upon them that I believe you should have them every year from 40, if you can afford it. I know obviously some people can't, but um, if you can, it's the best first line of defence that you have. Uh, and finding it early, as I know, means it's, so much more likely to have a good outcome. So I know my family are very grateful for it. Um, mammograms themselves, I know some women find them kind of uncomfortable. I don't particularly. Uh, the first time you're always a little bit nervous because, you know, there's that 
you know, you know uh, is anyone going to see me naked and have I got weird <laughs> boobs? Um, is it going to hurt squashing them between two glass plates? Um, I, I actually don't find it's a problem at all. If it is uncomfortable, you've got to remember it's only for a few seconds. And uh, again, it could save your life. So um, yeah, that is, that is my continuing message to people is go and get those mammograms, make that appointment, nag those around you to make the appointment. Um, as women, we are so, so good at looking after our loved ones, making sure they go to doctor's appointments, making sure they go to the dentist. We're really lousy when it comes to ourselves. We push our priorities way down the list and we need to stop because actually in being selfish and taking time out to look after your own health, you're actually helping everybody around you. Great, thank you for that heartfelt message, Lorna, that was great. Uh, now we're going to hear from Dr. Monica Sani, a radiologist at Hutt Valley DHB in Wellington-ish, <laughs> um, and also as, um, works at Volpara, Chief Medical Officer at Volpara Solutions. Monica, what's a mammogram and how well do they work? I'm glad you asked. I'm glad that we, <laughs> we already started the subject. So. There's a variety of tools that we radiologists, myself, Sally, and I use to help look at women's breast tissue. And the first exam is the screening mammogram. And as Lorna was so nicely explaining, it does require some gentle compression. And a mammogram includes some low-dose radiation, extremely low-dose. And so we do take two pictures per breast, so that means four pictures altogether. And that gives us an overall view of what the breast looks like from the inside, what changes are occurring, and what's normal for you as a woman. And that is the gold standard that we've come across um, all over the world. As you can tell, I have an American accent, and it's a test we use in many different countries. And what we've found over doing this over a few different decades is that doing mammography in regular intervals helps decrease breast cancer death. So that's why it's the gold standard test. But it's not the only test that we radiologists have to look at breast tissue. Uh, other tests include things like breast ultrasound. Now breast ultrasound, some of you may have experienced an ultrasound for different reasons, maybe when you were pregnant or a variety of other health issues. But breast ultrasound is a test that we sometimes use if we need to investigate an area that we see that's abnormal on the mammogram or if there is a palpable lump that either you or your practitioner feels. And it allows you to lie on your back. It doesn't use radiation. In fact, it uses sound waves. And it generates a nice gray picture for us to look at. And it's fairly easy to perform in the office. So we use that oftentimes in conjunction with the mammogram. The other test that you may also have heard of is a breast MRI. Now this is a test that requires um, a magnetic field, so there's no radiation as well. You lay on your stomach rather than on your back. It takes about 30 to 45 minutes, and it does require an injection of colorless dye. Now this is a test that we reserve only for particular patients. Um, those may be people who are newly diagnosed with breast cancer, and we're trying to see if there's any hidden disease that wasn't seen on the mammogram or ultrasound. We also may use this test for patients we know are at high risk, and that may mean that they have other risk factors, um, family history or genetic mutations, or a variety of other issues that may be assessed by your doctor that puts you in the high risk category. So it's another one of the tools that we radiologists have to use. Um, one other tool I'll mention, and some of you may have heard, is 3D mammography or tomosynthesis. And so that is another type of mammogram. And instead of having two images or pictures per breast, it can give us anywhere from 50 to 100 pictures per breast. And we do use that tool in conjunction with some of the others that I mentioned. It does sometimes require um, more radiation. Um, it's still very low dose. But sometimes we use that tool, um, depending on the center you go to, when you return if there is a question on the initial mammogram or if there's a particular area of concern we need to investigate further. So those are some of the different tools we use in different ways, and we try to figure out the best 
ways to assess any particular problem. But as I mentioned, the first test and the first line is having the 2D mammogram that I first started talking about. Now, in addition to that, another topic is breast density. And some of you may have heard some more about breast density. And this is an area of new and exciting research for us in radiology. And as you can see on the slide we provided, those are examples of different mammograms from different breasts. And on the left side, you can see an image of a woman who has a very fatty replaced breast, or fatty tissue, and that's mostly gray. Whereas as you move towards the right side of the slide, you're seeing mammograms with women who have more dense or fibroglandular tissue. So what we've found is that breast tissue is composed of two types of tissue, fatty tissue, and fibrous or fibroglandular tissue. So we know that when you have more of the fibrous or white tissue, it does make it a little harder for us to find cancers on those type of mammograms. And that's because there's a masking effect. So fibrous tissue looks white, as you can see on the mammogram on the far right. But cancer also appears white. So it can mask a cancer. Another way of thinking about it is it's like looking for a snowball in a snowstorm. So this is an area of research where we radiologists are trying to find different ways to identify cancer in these type of dense breasts. And we're still doing a lot of research, and we don't know right now how many patients in the population in New Zealand have these dense breasts. And we're looking at when that is identified, what different type of tests we might be able to do. In some parts of the world, that may include doing a test like an ultrasound to look at that dense breast tissue. But it's an exciting area of research. Now, it's important for us to re remember that if you have a normal mammogram and you notice a change in your breast, to still have that investigated by first your general practitioner and then if they deem it's appropriate by your radiologist. And it's always good to know the normal look and feel of your breast. And a normal mammogram shouldn't stop you from having anything that's changing further investigated. I am. Okay. Great. Thank you so much, Monica. Now we're going to hear from Dr. Sarah <coughs> Yuri. She's Clinical Director for Breast Screen Counties Manukau, and she's also a breast radiologist at Ascot Radiology in Auckland. Sally, tell us more about screening mammograms. Who's entitled to them, and how can we prepare for them? Thanks, Adele. Evening. I uh, want to talk about the number, the areas of screening that are accessible in New Zealand, and by far the most well-known is the screening program run through Breast Screen Aotearoa, which was established in New Zealand at the end of 1998, and it's free to all eligible women. It's a well women service. It's not about women turning up with lumps and symptoms in their breasts, and it's the lawners of the uh, world. And it offers free screening mammography for all women at two yearly intervals between 45 and 69. There are eight different lead providers in the country, and uh, so there's a geographical, uh, there's a slide showing the areas of the country that are covered from uh, Cape Brianga down to the bottom of Stewart Island. And in through, through Breast Screen Aotearoa, we have a number of fixed subsites. Some of these are related to DHBs or district health boards, and others are related to private locations. And we also have mobile vans. And there's a second form of screening that exists in New Zealand, and that's, uh, you, that's through your district health board, where you are outside the screening program age group, but you have risks or are deemed to be uh, suitable to be screened. You still are a well woman and you need to be referred to the DHB by either your GP or a specialist. Again, it's free. But each district health board in the country have uh, different acceptance criteria. They're not that different, but there are some unique uh, aspects. And then, of course, the third 
type of screening for breast cancer in the country can be accessed through private radiology providers, of which there are many in uh, almost in most rural locations, uh, urban, I'm sorry, loca locations. So as Monica's talked about, what's a mammogram? It's a radiology test. It uses x-rays to take pictures of your breast. You'll be asked to take the, the, your top clothing off, your, including your bra, and you'll be offered a gown to wear whilst the study is being performed. It'll just be you and the MRT or radiographer, same, same terminology, for, who's always a female in this country, um, in the room, although there's always an opportunity to have a support person with you. And that person will usually be asked to wear, a, well, will always be asked to wear a lead um, protection apron. The MRT takes those four uh, pictures, two pictures of each breast, side to side and top to bottom. Compression, squeezing, really painful but uncomfortable. And take it any size. We can cope with any size, big, small, and in the middle. <laughs> and also any shape, screen. <laughs> and how do I prepare? Well, you can, you, you can come with a family member to use as an interpreter if that's what you need. Also, it's often a quite a good idea to be five minutes early if you can. And uh, tell us when you make the appointment. This is either with breast screener at HERA or at a private provider or at the DHB. If you've got any physical uh, limitations or impairments that we need to know about so we can be prepped to help you. And tell us if you've got breast implants and wear a skirt or a pair of pants or shorts so that uh, you just have to take your top off. Try not to put deodorant or talcum powder on your armpits or your breasts on that day. It's pretty automatic, but it sometimes it can cause little speckles on the outside of the mammogram on the breast that we, can, we need to interpret and exclude from being something other than uh, talcum powder. And if you've got previous images from any other source, it be that on disk or uh, be on the film screen, the film um, medium that we used to use, we still like to see those, and they're useful for you to bring along. And uh, the best time to come is probably just ask your periods if you have particularly tender um, breasts when you get your periods. So just after it's finished, and always you're welcome to bring a support person if you need from either family, whanau. How do I make an appointment through BSA, Breast Screen Aotearoa? I can register myself electronically, online. I can ring the 0800 number, 0800 270 or I can be referred by my GP. Often we run the, the district lead, the different lead providers run promotional events in the community, and they'll sign you up. Or a family mem member can enrol you if you've give consent for that to happen. Who's eligible? Women aged 45 to 69 or transgender who identify as being female, being a New Zealand citizen, resident, work permit holder for over two years, haven't been diagnosed with breast cancer in the last five years, hasn't had a mammogram anywhere else in the previous 12 months, and really doesn't have any new symptoms because it's a well woman service. Your results, your images will be read by two qualified radiologists and you'll get your results within two weeks. If the two radiologists agree, your GP will get a letter, uh, be in electronically, sorry, um, notified and sometimes uh, by letter and you'll get a letter. And uh, if the radiologists want to recall a client or a patient for extra views, the appointment will be made personally by the nurse on the phone. You'll come, be invited to come to an assessment centre and you'll meet with the breast care nurse. you will take a history and examine you. You'll see the MRT or the technologist and you'll see the radiologist who will talk to you and usually perform ultrasound. You may or may not need a biopsy and that'll be scheduled either done there and then or be scheduled for another daytime or convenient opportunity for you. And, uh, and then your results are discussed at our big multidisciplinary team meeting with the surgeons, the radiologists, the oncologists, the nurses, the pathologists, and all the students who are training in all those areas as well. 
and, uh, and then you'll have a face-to-face -face discussion with the results. What happens with, we screen a thousand women in New Zealand in a week in one service perhaps, sometimes it's more, sometimes it's fewer, about between 50 and 80 of that thousand women will be recalled for assessment. About 20 of those thousand women will end up with a biopsy and a cancer diagnosis will be made in anything between about five and seven women of that original thousand. So it's like a pyramid that gets smaller and smaller as you go up. What's next? If I'm found to have cancer, you'll be referred to a surgeon or a surgical service that you choose that can either be in the public system or in the private system. And you'll always be the master of the speed. You can determine when you have it and you've got plenty of time to discuss the options with your family and your friends and the team that are looking after you. And what if I do if my mammogram's normal or after my assessment and my breasts are normal? You'll automatically be recalled in two years' time. That'll happen around 21 to 27 months since your previous screen. The real issue, ladies, is that it's very important for you to come back at the two years because we want to find these cancers early. And that's when we can really impact the effect of uh, screening on reducing mortality from breast cancer. I just want to have a quick run around what is high risk for breast cancer. I know that webinars previously have talked about genetic uh, predisposition, but are you high risk if you've had previous cancer, you've got a very strong family history of breast cancer, you've got a genetic mutation, and there are several of those, and I won't go into them, or you've had chest radiation, such as they call it mantle radiotherapy or mantle radiation, which is given to um, people with um, chest lymphoma. And if you've had that under the age of 50, you're high risk. And what should I do if I'm high risk? You should have a mammogram every year. And in some situations and age groups, an MR every year will be recommended. And how do I access these? Again, your high risk screening can come through the DHBs or through the private radiology practices with referrals from your GP or specialist. Another question that's quite common is, can I have my screening as a high-risk person every year on one of the mobiles? We'd all love, as clinical leads for the breast screening program throughout the country, to say yes. Unfortunately, at this stage, we don't have the capacity to, that, to do that. In, in the northern half of the South Island, they are offering high-risk screening on the mobile in some parts of that part of the South Island, particularly in the geographically challenged areas. However, that's a work in progress and it's something that uh, we all want to look at and to be able to add. That's all I've got to say, uh, unless I've got more questions. Great. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Sally, and thanks to all three of you. That's been really great. We're now going to open up to some questions from you at home. You can type questions in the box at the bottom left of your screen and we'll get through um, as many as we can in, in the time available. Um, I do have a couple sitting here. The first one for Monica. Uh, Monica, could you please um, revisit the sensitivity of 65% and, and explain a bit more about what that means? Sure. So when you look at the sensitivity, which means the ability to find cancer on traditional mammography, it's somewhere between 85 to 90%, um, which is quite excellent, and that's in all women. Um, one issue we've come across when I mentioned the more dense breast is that the sensitivity does go down, so it can go down to as much as 65%. And that's an area of concern that we may not be able to as easily see breast cancers in those women with dense breasts. And that's where we're trying to do further research to see how we can better do complete testing in those women. Thank you. Um, Sally, maybe one for you. How long does it take to have a mammogram? Well, usually your appointment, will, if it's in the screening program, will be scheduled for between 12 and 15 minutes. And it will take, in the room, you will probably be in the room for anything from about two to four minutes, sometimes up to five minutes, depending on how easy it is for the MRT to screen your breasts. And dependent on your size, a bit longer for bigger breasts because they may have to take more images to make sure they cover the whole breast. 
a little bit more for implants because we need to take more views of the breasts to make sure that we cover the areas of the breast as well as assess the anterior, the front of the implant. So, and then the MRT needs to check that they feel the imaging that they've done is diagnostic, is adequate enough, and we look for excellence every single time from an MRT, but is adequate enough for the radiologist to then be able to interpret the images. Because if we're not given the best quality, it doesn't matter how much good equipment we've got, so we're terribly dependent upon the MRT, the girl who take the woman and lady girl who takes the images, they're all specifically trained and they're great support people and they uh, they're, they're part of the journey. I think the thing about screening about mammography, it's such an intimate uh, thing to have done to your breasts, and you are meeting strangers. And it's a huge leap of faith by the by women coming in which, whichever venue they come into, whether it be to breast screen at TRO, be it into a private practice, be it to a breast clinic in a district health board, with a normal breast or with a symptom in your breast. And it's also there's always a not always, but in a lot with a lot of women there's a raised level of anxiety when they're coming for a screening mammogram, particularly if they've had a past history of breast cancer or they've got a family history. But that doesn't mean that, and it just that's another side about family history, only 10% of the breast cancers that are diagnosed in the country every year have a family history, which means there are 90% of the cancers with no family history. So the, that intimate relationship with the MRT, the radiographer, is critical. And we in Breast Screen Aotearoa and in the training services, teaching and tutoring and educating our staff and then ongoing support, we really value uh, the trust that every single woman puts in them and then puts into into the nurse and the radiologist who may see you subsequently if you have something of concern. So I take my hat off to all the women who come for mammograms and I take my hat off to all the staff who look after women and that goes for everyone including the people who are promoting and asking you to come for breast screening. Mm -hmm. I found everybody that I've dealt with absolutely fantastic and very reassuring and very warm and the process pretty quick. In and out in half an hour, something you can do in your lunch hour. Yeah. yeah. And there's a lot of trust around it and I think, again, as we uh, want to emphasise, there's a huge amount of confidentiality that goes on in all aspects of medicine. And when I talk about that MDM meeting or the MDT where there's a lot of people it is such a, um, it's an amazing experience to be able to, I say to a lot of the women I see, well, we're going to talk to you, talk about you behind your back and then we'll see you after that and tell you what, we've, what we are going to say to you and recommend. But it's a very uh, refreshing and humbling experience to work in a team like that with all the experiences that come. And all the perspectives, right? With all the perspectives of the surgeon, the oncologist, um, everyone coming together to really come with a unified approach. I think it's a really good thing for women. So, we can one so, so Monica, um, what, a question for you. What additional information does an MRI or ultrasound provide that you don't get on a mammogram? So let's start with the MRI. That's kind of the big gun, I call it. That test, because we give the IV dye, gives us a lot of information looking at blood flow through the breast. And, and that's particularly one of the reasons why it's so sensitive and its ability to pick up breast cancer is greater. Now, the reason why we reserve breast MRI for only specific appropriate patients is because that sensitivity can also come with some downsides, which is false positives. So it's a great task to use for a woman where she's at high risk, as Sally mentioned, um, some of the criteria for what high risk is. 
so the mammogram alone may not be enough. It's also a test that can be quite helpful in the women where we have a new diagnosis of breast cancer, and especially in that scenario I mentioned where they may have more dense breast tissue, um, that it, itself has been identified as a new risk factor. And so in that situation, we're better able to find um, perhaps a second breast cancer or find out that the cancer is a little bit larger or more involved. And that's helpful information for our breast surgeons and for our patients so that when you're making decisions to treatment, you really go in knowing all of the story and the full picture. Now with ultrasound, ultrasound, because it uses the sound wave technology um, and not the, the radiation x-ray, it comes up with a different set of images. And so the ultrasound can be helpful again um, where we have some hiding or masking effect on the mammogram, and a woman or her provider feels a lump, and we want to go evaluate that area, and perhaps we're not seeing a change in the mammogram, or the change is too subtle. So the ultrasound can help as a second-line tool. Um, it's also a great test for younger women. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes, if the woman's under 35, and this recommendation sort of varies depending where you go, but you may come in, um, let's say, with a lump that you feel, we may start with the ultrasound. So having these different tests are great tools for radiologists like myself so we can evaluate on each patient what's the best way that we can get an answer and give you the assurance that we are able to evaluate this fully and figure out the next step. Because someone else has also asked um, what, what about having an ultrasound instead of a mammogram? Now, this is a woman who's had breast cancer, and she says her sister prefers to just have an ultrasound. Yeah, and I, um, I think that's a common question. Here's the thing. Um, as I mentioned earlier, mammography is the gold standard. We have a great amount of data um, being able to show that we can find breast cancers reliably. I think the other important thing to realize that ultrasound does not pick up something that are seen on mammography. For instance, calcifications, which oftentimes are like the DCIS that Lorna mentioned. We may not be able to see that on an ultrasound. Also, ultrasound, one of the things that can be difficult is to evaluate the whole breast. It requires a, um, either a radiologist or a sonographer to take a five centimeter probe, it's about the size of my hand, and to go through the entire breast. So there's some subjectivity to it, and there's also some false positives that can come with it. So that is why it's not recommended as a screening tool on its own. So really, that's if we want to get a full, complete picture of the breast, we really want to start with the mammogram and then decide if the ultrasound is of help. Right, that's super interesting. Thank you. Um, and now another one for Sally. Can you please define further high-risk family history? What, what does that mean? It, there are slightly different criteria uh, across providers in, uh, internationally. But on, in the main, family history uh, is, described, is um, defined by having a first-degree relative who has pre-menopausal breast cancer. Now, menopause can happen any time between 45 and 58, I guess, or 60. Commonly around uh, in the early 50s to mid-50s. And there's nothing magical about when or not you get menopause. And there's nothing magical about menopause changing the entire story in your breast. But it's just one marker. So if a woman has a sister or a mother who has developed cancer, breast cancer younger than 50, for example, or 55, some services use, that's classified as high risk. If you have a first degree relative who's had bilateral breast cancer, regardless of age, that means in both breasts, that also increases your risk. Um, and that is really about it in terms of high-risk family history. Great. Thank you. But in saying that, there's always an art to the definition, 
and the discussion, if you've got concern, the discussion is always worth having with your general practitioner or your specialist or your radiologist if you happen to see him or her at the time of the study. Great. And actually our breast care nurses here at Breast Cancer Foundation can also run through the genetic health service checklist yeah. with you and refer you on if necessary. So do give us a call and we'll have that number up at the end of the webinar. Um, now, um, a couple more sort of technology type questions, Monica, which I'll hand to you. Um, what, are, are you using contrast mammography, or is anyone using that, I guess, and are you using tomo biopsy, which is not something I'm familiar with? Um, good questions. So contrast enhanced mammography is not a tool I'd discuss because I'm, I'm not aware. Sally, do you have no. anyone? Okay. No. So. As far as I understand, no one is yet using it in New Zealand. However, it looks like it could be a really excellent tool. Uh, a number of colleagues are using it in Australia, in the States, and in Europe. And it's, again, a test where an IV injection is required. And some people are looking at using this test for women who are newly diagnosed with breast cancer. Some people are also using it for lumps that there are no findings or nothing that we can see on the mammogram and ultrasound. So they sometimes use it to do something we call problem solving and trying to see if there's something hiding in the breast tissue not visible on the mammogram or ultrasound. And with the use of the contrast injection, it sometimes uncovers maybe what's going on in the tissue. So at this time, no one's using it in New Zealand, but I think it's a very promising technology, and I think we may see some more providers starting to go that way. Mm -hmm. The other benefits of that test are it's significantly cheaper than a breast MRI in most places. It's easier to access because an MRI machine is a rather large and expensive machine, and it needs quite a bit of equipment and personnel to run it. Mm -hmm. And so whereas a contrast-enhanced mammogram could be performed pretty much anywhere where you could do a mammogram. Right. So that's some of the advantages. And then remind me, the second question oh, was, Tomo. oh, Tomo, okay. Mm -hmm. So the 3D mammography or tomosynthesis, those are the same things. Um, when you take the additional, let's say, 50 to 100 images, and you find something in one of those images, then you want to go and see if you can biopsy, if it's suspicious. And if you can't see it on the regular mammogram, usually the next line is to go do an ultrasound. So now that you've really figured out where it is in the breast, um, most of the time we can usually go and find it on the ultrasound and do a biopsy that way. And um, when doing a biopsy, ultrasound is usually the preferred method because it's so much more comfortable for the patient. You get to lay on your back. Um, it's just easier and it's quicker. Um, tomosynthesis guided biopsy where we don't see it on the ultrasound is another tool where basically you're using the 3D mammography technology and then putting the biopsy capability. And there's a few centers, I think, around the country that have that, but not many um, that do. So honestly, there are other ways for us to approach this problem. And then if we can't find it on ultrasound um, and not on mammography, then sometimes that's where we consider doing an MRI test if we don't have the tomosynthesis guided biopsy technology. OK, great. Um, and now um, another question, which maybe the, the two of you might like to discuss. And apparently, a couple of people are having trouble hearing us. So if we can just try and um, speak out. Um, the, um, here's someone who says, my breast physician recommended annual mammogram and ultrasound for me from age 40. Um, and of course, the free service starts at 45. What are your thoughts on this? And is this a generally accepted thought? Lots of discussion points there. <laughs> there was our, sure. Um, so this is a very complicated you know, question and complicated answer. So let me start with, there may be a variety of reasons that your um, physician recommended this. Um, one may be that they're having difficulty with the breast exam, which is not uncommon, where it's hard to determine what might be a normal lumpy area of breast tissue as opposed to an actual physical lump. And sometimes in challenging breast exams, um, sometimes providers look at different tools to try to answer that question. I think, you know, for the asymptomatic woman who's not having any issues, I think doing, you know, starting with your screening mammogram 
and going on your every two-year schedule is perfectly acceptable. Now, if you have risk factors, as Sally mentioned, then that puts you in a different criteria where you might be getting yearly mammograms and even, as Sally mentioned, yearly MRI. So there's different ways for us to kind of address these type of issues or symptoms. Um, I think what's not known at this time, and that's why you're going to find a lot of people recommending a lot of different things, is what if you're not high risk? What if you're not average risk, but there is some concern, you have some risk factors um, that don't put you in the high risk category, and now what do we do? So that's why you're seeing a variety of approaches and where some providers might be recommending to start your mammogram at 40, which clearly you can do in private. Um, and the ultrasound, obviously, you can do that. But that's not always affordable and feasible or accessible to everyone. So I think, you know, trying to give you a blanket recommendation without knowing maybe all of the different things in your history is difficult to do. So each woman may want to have that discussion with her provider of what are her risk factors and what are the things that would best help her find breast cancer earlier and give her assurance that everything is okay. Mm -hmm. uh, just to add, uh, I agree with everything that Monica said, but there, is, uh, there are a number of screening programs throughout the world who start screening at 45, but offer screening from the age of 40. There are also a number of providers and involved uh, uh, parts of the breast uh, awareness program that talk about starting breast screening at 40. And it's not wrong. I think the thing about it is that the first mammogram, whatever time or date or age you are when you have it, that is your baseline. That is your reference point. Because everybody's breasts are different. Everybody's hands are different. Their fingerprints are different. So you always, it's much easier to read the second mammogram or the third mammogram or the fourth mammogram because you've got the baseline and you know where you started from. So there, regular screening mammography from the age of 40 is commonly recommended in New Zealand and everywhere else in the world. It doesn't mean that it's wrong, that the breast screening program doesn't start at 40. At the end of the day, the Breast Screen Aotearoa is a publicly funded screening program and we are targeting the highest incidence of breast cancer and with all the stats that we have at the moment, nationally and internationally, 45 to 69 is where the money is. And it is that women under 45 get breast cancer. There's no doubt about it. However, the proportion of women between 40 and 45 who develop breast cancer, I'm not talking about the significance of it to them or their families or their communities or their employers, it's about the fact that the number of them is you have to screen a lot more 40 to 45-year-olds to find the four cancers in every thousand that we find between 45 and 69. It's not my um, gig in terms of making those decisions, but I get involved in it, asking the advice around it, and I guess at this stage in my career, that's where I stand and the majority of us do. But great question yeah. and great <laughs> issues. <laughs> it is. And, and Breast Cancer Foundation, many of you will have seen that we say consider starting at 40 and going annually till 49 and then every two years. But discuss that with your GP, uh, as you say. Get that baseline and go from there. We'd also say if you're in an area with more than one private provider and that's the way you're going, ask around and get um, and, and shop smartly because <laughs> prices do vary quite a bit actually and, and, and many are using the same equipment, so check that out too. Uh, we have several questions here about another controversial topic, thermography, um, asking what is it, does it work and why don't we use it in screening? Well, <laughs> I'll let you start. <laughs> Thermography is a technique that assesses heat. Makes sense, doesn't it? 
asthma. And cancer of any sort, in the main, the majority of cancer, anywhere in the body, is a vascular structure, which means it has a lot of blood supply. And the concept of thermography is that if you've got a cancer, if you have a cancer developing in your breast, it will show as a hot area on your thermogram. I think I might just leave it at that. Uh, in terms of what I would recommend, international studies have shown that there is no repeatable, um, what's the word I'm looking for, randomised control trial that proves that thermography actually finds breast cancer. And the reality is, in my opinion, and there is a statement from Breast Screen Aotearoa, a national statement, which I'm sure we can pop on the uh, website How for the done? webinar. Yep. It's on the website, but we can add it in the webinar. It's uh, about our position on uh, thermography, and it raises more questions than answers in some women, and in the other women it creates security that may be artificial. Would, so would I be right in thinking that something like DCIS, which is so small and so early stage... Uh, unlike, absolutely. Yeah. So by the time it becomes big enough to perhaps show um, any heat, it might have progressed significantly. Yeah. So, so I'll answer from a couple different perspectives. Um, I've had a number of patients who've had thermography in the past and have come, from, come to me after um, with two scenarios. Either the thermogram was normal and their doctor urged them to get a mammogram in addition, and then the second was the thermogram was abnormal and their doctor urged them to get further follow-up. Um, and I have not found that thermography consistently found anything that I could do. And in fact, it's never found a cancer um, in my personal experience. And so a number of times we would have patients quite panicked coming in with a hot spot or two on a thermogram, and we would maybe at most find some inflamed cysts, which also can have some vascular blood supply to them. So, um, you know, my concern is that you're not reliably finding breast cancer, and, I, you know, patients walking away just getting a thermogram are not actually having their breast screened for breast cancer. So much so that in the U.S., um, the Federal Drug and Food Administration has forced people who provide thermography to remove breast cancer screening from one of their advertisements. You can't say it's a screening tool. And mostly for what Sally said, we don't have any consistent data that has shown that we can find breast cancer reliably. And I say this from a perspective of having lived in a community in the U.S. where we looked at a lot of different therapies, and I have a lot of patients who are interested in alternative therapies, and I think alternative medicine and complementary medicine has its place and really great tools. Um, but this is not something I consider alternative medicine because I don't see that there's any data to support it, and it does not find breast cancer. So I think you have to be cautious when you go down that way of looking for additional ways to take care of oneself, make sure that there's good data and good evidence that you're going to actually look at your health reliably mm -hmm. and find the answers you're looking for. Mm -hmm. And Lorna, maybe um, one here for you. Um, you've had surgery for DCIS yes. and so on, so and now you're going back for regular screening. How do mm -hmm. you kind of handle that from a stress point of view? And I've got to say, the first uh, the first screening I had um, post my surgery and my radiotherapy, I was very nervous, I was very anxious, um, and I'm a glass half full kind of gal, <laughs> um, but I think it's only natural. I also knew that a friend of mine who had had exactly the same experience I had had perhaps 18 months earlier, she'd had an abnormal screening the first time back, and um, she had to go through the biopsy again. Yes. Turned out to not be cancerous the second time, um, but so I was almost prepared for it to happen and hugely relieved um, when it was fine. So, uh, and I've had two more since, and everything's been fine. I think the the anxiety lessens. I guess it's with, like anything, isn't it? When when something bad happens to you, then you fear that that's going to happen again. But over time, 
you know, and it certainly wouldn't put, put me off. In fact, quite the opposite. I'm yeah. I'm adamant that um, even once I've I've reached my five years, um, that I will continue to have annual mammograms. Um, something I did want to ask you, though, Sally, is that um, when I finish my five years, I'm not automatically back on the screening program, am I? Uh, you should be. Because they're the register, you are excluded from the breast screening program for that five right. years. And then if the data has been entered accurately, which we... Right. Is, it's a very controlled program. We've got a book of rules and targets. You will then be re-invited into the breast right. screening program. And at our, in our... Uh, neck of the woods, we work very, very, very closely with the diagnostic service in the breast screening, in the um, DHB, as happens in many other places. And uh, we offer alternates, so the breast screening program will screen that woman in year six, and she'll have it year seven in the diagnostic service. Yeah and year eight back in the uh, screening mm. program. Mm. And uh, we have criteria in our DHB, our breast clinic, around how long we'll screen after the diagnosis of breast cancer. But uh, you will automatically come back into the screening program if you remain eligible. I would just say that um, County's Manukau is great like that, but that's not the same in, in uh, areas. I agree. It's, different. So, uh, uh, it's different. So, so yeah. So, 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 don't, <laughs> so if you haven't heard from from breast screen and it's five years after your diagnosis, and you may be having alternate year screening in the breast clinic at the hospital, but do get in touch. Do yeah. get in touch yeah, with the breast screen. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Sally, will tomosynthesis ever replace two D mammograms for screening? Well, uh, tom tomosynthesis is definitely um, increasing in um, availability throughout the country. There is no doubt that tomosynthesis increases the cancer detection rate. All the research that's been done over the last 10 years to 15 years in tomo have shown that. Uh, it also reduces the chances of you having to be recalled if you've had a mammogram that is read after by your radiologist, which is the case in the screening program, and does happen in private practice as well and in DHBs. So it means that the radiologist has more information. However, there's always a trade-off with everything that uh, TOMO is, it takes longer for the radiologist to interpret the images. It doesn't take that much longer to obtain the images, actually. We, most of the, uh, a, a bit longer, but we're only talking a matter of half a minute. Mm. And uh, it's no more, it's very little uh, more, and there, there's virtually no difference in radiation between a screening tomosynthesis examination and a 2D um, examination, depending on the uh, equipment that's being used and the providers of those equipment, the manufacturers, I mean. So, um, it uh, will it ever replace? I, I think there. I know there are centres throughout um, the US that only have tomosynthesis, and the majority of those units may have tomosynthesis biopsy as w capability as well. Mm -hmm. That is also increasing as different manufacturers throughout the world develop that technology and add it to their already um, 2D uh, or tomosynthesis units. Um, money, capacity, opportunity, uh, motivation, um, those are all factors in terms of who's providing the service. And uh, the reality is that a mammogram unit used frequently, you know, often as ours are, has a life expectancy of around seven to eight years. But there are places where it's not so busy, so it lasts longer, or there are other places where we sweat the assets um, because uh, that's just the funding. So it, it, it may come a time when it's all tomosynthesis because the older machines just aren't being serviced or able to be maintained. But I don't see it necessarily as happening. Um, tomosynthesis on mobile vans is in the US, is it? Um, there's, I can't pro that there's probably a few centers. I, I was going to add a couple comments. So, um, 
couple of things you have to know with tomal synthesis. Um, we still need those 2D images to look at the whole breast, not just the individual slices. The individual slices have a bit of a fuzzy look to them. And so there is, um, the technology has allowed that the tomal synthesis images can then be reconstructed to make that 2D image. The one thing you do have to realize is that reconstructed 2D image is not quite as good as just taking a regular 2D image. It's getting there, but it's not quite as good. And there has been studies looking at the ability to find little calcifications or calcium deposits on the reconstructed um, image is not as good as taking a full-on 2D. So um, there are centers that take a 2D mammogram and then do your 3D mammogram. In that case, you do get double the radiation dose. So very low, but you're getting double. So we have to keep that in mind. And I'll make one other point. Um, in the patients who have extremely dense breasts, um, which we don't know what that percentage is in New Zealand, but you know, in Australia and the U.S., it's roughly about 9% of the population, tomosynthesis does not help. I was giving the example of like cement. So no matter how thin you cut the cement, you still can't see it. So it's a great tool in some patients, um, but it's, it's not a great tool in all patients. And on that question of radiation, um, there are people, a couple of people saying, what about the level of radiation in mammography? Is that a worry? And um, for example, you know, your dentist leaves the room when x-raying your teeth. So should we be worried about this with mammography? I'll, I'll start if you like. And yes. then, so, um, and I bring up radiation because I don't want to make sure that we gloss over it. It's so extremely, extremely low dose. So one way I explain it in just layman's terms is when I lived in the States, which is, you know, not the same, we used to say it's the same as taking an airplane flight from Chicago to L.A., a transcontinental flight. You could do the same thing as saying you were going from Auckland to northern Australia because you're going to get the same radiation dose in the plane at that altitude in the ambient atmosphere. And people have done really in-depth studies looking at what, how much radiation does it take before you actually develop cancer. And they studied um, survivors from Hiroshima um, looking at where they were given such a huge exposure of radiation and then developed a number of different cancers and what the body can take. And the, they were then able to extrapolate what is the minimum amount, you know, where someone develops a cancer. We are way, way below that. So you are not at risk, even if you come in, let's say you're getting mammograms every two years, or if you're in the other parts of the world where you're doing it every year, and you do it from 40 to 80, you are not increasing your risk of developing breast cancer. So the radiation dose is that low. And I'm just using those ways of explaining it rather than going into technical, physical terms. Yep, yep. Good way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that you understand. Yeah. Don't have anything to add. Great. Yeah. Um, oh. We are nearly up on time, but I do have another question here. Um, maybe, Sally, if a woman is on HRT, I heard that a yearly mammogram is recommended. What are your thoughts on that? There is proof, incontrovertible proof, that HRT is a risk factor. Not a high risk factor, but it increases your risk of developing breast cancer. And so the recommendation is if you're on long-term HRT, and I mean that over five years, and HRT is an amazing drug. <laughs> For those women that need it, it is absolutely fantastic. But over five years, definitely the recommendation is to have annual mammography and to possibly reassess the discussion pre as relatively frequently with your primary care physician. But less than five years? So I think there's some data saying that um, if you're on combined HRT, yes. estrogen and progesterone versus just estrogen, so the people who, they looked at some trials where if you were just on estrogen, there was actually a slightly increased risk. The estrogen and progesterone combined therapy, um, a little bit less risk than the estrogen alone. Um, agreed, shorter timeline. And so um, talking with GPs and OB-GYNs, um, the idea is to use um, some of that HRT to help get through the worst of the menopausal symptoms and then see if they can taper down um, to a point where it's more tolerable 
Again, this is outside of what uh, Sally and yeah. I do, and so yeah. I highly recommend you have this discussion with your GP or OB-GYN um, to really get the best and latest information on that. Great. Now, I'm just going to, before we finish off, I'm just going to flip back to one of Monica's slides that we didn't really get a good chance to see. But, um, this is a really important point. <laughs> so let's all, uh, those of us who are at the right age, go and get our mammograms regularly. That would be great. Okay, now I'm just going to flip right through to the end here. Um, right. Um, thank you so much for joining us. As I said, time is up. And thank you again to Lorna and Monica and Sally. Um, we hope that you guys at home found this helpful and we'd appreciate if you could take a moment to fill out our exit survey as you leave the webinar. That would be great. Uh, if you have any questions or about your family risk or about screening or anything else, you can call our nurses on 0800 BC Nurse during office hours. In the next few days, we'll email you all a link to the recording of this webinar if you'd like to watch it again or recommend it to someone else. Thank you again for joining us and good night.